live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering ServiceNow Knowledge 2018. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, and we're here at Knowledge 18. This is our sixth CUBE at ServiceNow Knowledge. Jeff Frick is my co-host. Jeff, when we started covering ServiceNow Knowledge, I think it was, it was under 4,000 people. The ARIA. We're at the Small ARIA, venue. very hip conference, but now we're talking about 18,000 people at K18, how ironic. Sean Convery is here, he's the Vice President and General Manager of the ServiceNow Security Business Unit. Welcome back to theCUBE, it's good to see you again, Sean. It's great to be back. So you know I'm a huge fan of your security initiative because you focused, what in our opinion is really the real problem, which is response. You're going to get hacked, you're going to get penetrated. Uh, we, we, it takes almost a year to find out when somebody's infiltrated your organization, they're exfiltrating data. You guys are focused on that problem. So, really have a lot of hope for this business in terms of addressing some of those challenges. But give us the update on the ServiceNow security business. Sure, yeah, so the business is continuing to grow nicely. I think we released uh, at the end of 2017 on our earnings report that uh, security and the other emerging businesses meet their aggressive, met their aggressive sales targets from 2017. So uh, we're seeing, you know, we're into the hundreds of customers stage now. We've got uh, very mature customers that are deployed in production. I think almost 40% of our customer base is Global 2000, so that's one of the benefits of being on, on the ServiceNow platform is we, we aren't perceived as a 1.0 or a 2.0, even though we've only been around for two years. You know, people are thinking of us as a, you know, as an application on top of an already very stable platform. One of the things we talk about a lot, and we've, you and I have talked about it, is what's the right regime for security? It, it's, it's all too often it's a, it's, a, it's a SecOps problem or it's an IT problem, and it's, you know, we preach that it's a team sport, it's everybody's problem, but when you extend into an organization from whatever, ITSM or whatever it is, to whom do you sell, who are your constituents, are, 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 you, are they figuring out that right regime, or is it really still the SecOps team? Yeah, so there's two major use cases in the security operations product. One is focused on security incident response, and that we're definitely selling primarily to the SOC, to the security operations center. But we have another uh, growing use case around vulnerability response, which is more the proactive side, where we're addressing really just security good hygiene. How do you reduce the attack surface area in your environment by having less vulnerable software in your environment, and that has a very tight tie to IT. Actually, they both have very tight ties to IT because in almost all cases, IT and IT operations are the actual execution arm of whatever changes you need to make to your infrastructure in response to something bad happening. Right, it's funny because we were at RSA this year, we've gone for a couple years, it's 40,000 people, it's a crazy big conference. But a couple of really interesting things that came out this year, um, one is that, as Dave said, you're going to get penetrated, right? So just a whole change of attitude in terms of not necessarily assuming you won't be, but how are you going to react when you are? How are you going to find out? And the other thing that comes up time and time again when we hear about breaches is it's this hygiene issue. It's somebody forgot to hit a switch, forgot to do a correct setting, forgot to do a patch, all these just like really yeah. kind of fundamental things that you need to do at a baseline to at least give you a chance to be able to you know, put up a defense against these people. Yeah, we, we actually just did a study with the Ponemon Institute of nearly 3,000 security professionals focused in on this hygiene problem on uh, vulnerability response and some of the stats are just staggering. You know, 70% uh, of organizations, 70% of respondents said security and IT don't have the same visibility into applications and systems. 55% said they spend more time coordinating a response among teams manually than they actually do in the act of patching itself. People are losing 12 days per update in manual coordination, because think about it, you've got not just IT and security, but you've got the GRC team, right? You've got the business owner, you've got the application owner. It's not just two folks sitting down at the table. It's a huge team right. looking at a multi-hundred thousand long spreadsheet of vulnerabilities that they're trying to respond to. And it's funny, because we talk often, it's an often quoted stat of you know, how many days have you been penetrated before you figure it out. Yeah. But what's less talked about is what you just talked about, is once you find out, then what's the, what's the delay where you can start taking proactive action and start taking care of all these things? And you said, that's just as complicated if not more. Well, and that's what the study actually bore out. So one of the things we did was we broke the data up into those that had been breached and those that had not been breached. And it was about 
but the biggest difference between the ones that had had a breach in the last two years and the ones that didn't is the one that the ones that had not been breached self-reported their vulnerability response program as 40% more effective than those that were breached. So this hygiene thing is just fundamental, and I actually have my personal theory that it's it's not as exciting an undertaking. It's much more fun to talk about how you've thwarted the bad guy that was knocking at your front door right. trying to find a way in. The the, the sort of proactive you know, execution of a, of a strategy to reduce your attack surface area is, uh, you know, is much less sexy. So, we've always talked about that magic number or, or scary number of the number of days that uh, it takes a company to realize they've been penetrated. Whatever, it ranges from 225, I've seen them higher than, than 300. And it's a couple years in now, and, and I'm curious as to what kind of data you have within your customer base. Have you been able to compress that time uh, and as Jeff points out, even more importantly, have you been able to compress the, the response time? Yeah, so there's, there's two stats I'll give you. One is, uh, for many organizations, they had zero reporting within their own organization. So if they were trying to report out, they were in the land of spreadsheets and email, so they couldn't tell you how big an impact it had. We actually commissioned a study with Forrester, they did a total economic impact, a TEI study, with our SecOps customers and found out that the average reduction in their uh, incident response time was 45% improvement, or 45% reduction in their response time, which is, which is dramatic. I mean, that's very meaningful to an organization, especially when there's nearly, or, or there's a prediction of an almost two million cybersecurity job shortfall in 2019. So there simply aren't the people to solve this problem, even right. if you could hire your way out of this. So what you would expect is if you can reduce that response time, and obviously you're freeing up resource, yeah. and then hopefully you can create some kind of flywheel effect uh, in terms of improving the situation. It's early, but what have you seen there? Yeah, I, that's exactly what we're seeing. So we're seeing people take the things that are, are painful and frequent and trying to automate those tasks so that they don't occur uh, as often and, and require people's time. You know, the analogy I always use is if you've ever watched a medical drama, you always see the, the doctor racing down the hallway holding up an x-ray to the fluorescent lights and making a call telling the nurse, you know, five milliliters of this or 10 milliliters of that. <laughs> and stat, stat. Stat, it's, stat. it's right, always it's stat, stat, right? Stat, whatever that means, I don't know. And they're saving the day, right? <laughs> they're saving the day, but that's what a security person wants to feel like. They want to feel like they're making that insightful call in the moment and saving the day, but instead, they're the doctor, they're the nurse, they're the orderly, they're the radiologist, they're the, you know, the administ administrative people. They have to play all those roles. Right. And what security automation is really about is let's take those mundane tasks you don't like anyway and get rid of them so you can focus on what truly matters. It is such an important piece because, like I said, RSA. There's 40,000 people, ton of ton of vendors. Like you know, and, and, the, and the CISO cannot buy all those solutions, right? So you have to, and, and for you guys to find a place to fit where you can have nice ROI, because you just can't, you just can't buy it all. And to me, it's it's kind of like insurance. At some point, you just can't buy more insurance. You can just buy to replace whatever it is that your insurance. So it's a real interesting kind of dilemma but you have to be secure, you don't want to be in the Wall Street Journal next week. Right. Tough challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a very tough challenge, and, and the, the notion that you can find a product to buy for every problem you have is something that the secur security community, if you go to RSA, it feels that way, right? Like, oh, I just need to buy another thing. But organizations have, on average, 80 security tools already. So the challenge is how do you actually reframe and think about prioritization in a different way? And so we're actually seeing our customers start to take advantage of, of the governance, risk, and compliance capabilities that are also part of ServiceNow to use risk as a north star for their security investments. So rather than just saying, oh, like this is the latest attack, so I need to go buy a, a thing that stops that attack, saying instead, what are my most valuable assets? What is the financial impact of a breach to those services? And then how do I invest accordingly? So I was watching a CUBE interview, uh, I think it was from KubeCon, John Furrier was doing an interview, and the gentleman he was interviewing said, the problem with security is, for years, organizations thought they could just buy some piece of technology and install it and solve the problem. Yeah. And it couldn't be further from the truth, right? So, yeah. describe what you're seeing as to those who are successful and best practice as to solving the problem. Sure, well that, that uh, thinking you can buy your way out of the problem goes all the way back to the early days of firewalls. I mean, I remember earlier in my career trying to convince people that a firewall by itself wasn't enough. So what we're seeing in, in organizations that are adopting best practices around response is they're taking a much more structured approach to how they respond to the most common attacks, things like a suspected phishing email, right? 
Uh, processing a phishing email that's reported by an employee, by a user, takes anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to check manually to see if it really is phishing or not. You know, with ServiceNow Security Operations, we can automate that down to seconds and allow that time for an analyst to go back to focusing on maybe a more advanced attack that does require more human ingenuity to, to be applied. Right. And the other thing that keeps coming up time and time again within the ServiceNow application and the platform is you like having lots of disparate data sources to pull from. You, you like it being kind of that automated overflow and workflow to leverage those investments for the boxes that they do have in the systems and all those things. You want to use them, but how do you get the most value out of those investments as well? Exactly, we're seeing that in most organizations don't feel like they're getting the value out of the assets that they've already invested in as well. So to, to steal one of, one of our CEO's lines, he talks about this idea of one plus one plus one equals magic. The idea that if you can bring together the right pieces of information, you can create this transformational outcome. And I think with security technology, if we can bring the data and the insights together on a common platform that allows you to uh, uh, investigate in a more automated way, to draw on the insights that you need from the various systems, and then to respond uh, uh, you know, in, the right, in, the right, um, in the right capacity at the right time, it's a, it's a completely different way of solving this problem that right. I think we're just beginning to explore. And a whole other place to apply AI and machine learning down the road as well. So you can start automating the responses at that tier uh, and a whole other level of automation to get the, the crap that I don't need to pay attention to off my screen so I can focus on the stuff that's most important. Oh absolutely, I think, we're, I think the, the, the headroom and the response category of technology, we're just beginning to see what's going to be possible as we continue to go down this path. Can you talk about the ecosystem a little bit? Obviously it's critical, and just to be clear, ServiceNow is not trying to replace Palo Alto networks, you know, or other security tools. You partner with those guys, uh, much in the same way as you're not trying to replace Workday and, and, and SAP and HR. Talk about that a little bit, the, the partner ecosystem, how that's growing and what role they play, where they leave off and where you pick up. Absolutely. So uh, as you said, we're not in the business of building prevention te to technology, detection technology. We are all about taking the investments you've already made and bringing them together. So we consider ourselves a neutral player in this market. We integrate with all sorts of different security technologies because again, the goal is, you know, let's take all these insights that are already in the various pieces of infrastructure. You know, we had one of our customers on stage yesterday during our keynote describing swivel chair, this notion of I'm swiveling from console to console to console and I'm burning time. If you can give me one place where I can bring that data together, uh, it, it's really valuable. And so we're quite different than many other ServiceNow products in that it's often not a human being that initiates the request. You know, a human says, hey, my laptop needs help, right? But in security, it's a third party tool that says, hey, go take a look at service X, we're seeing some weird behavior there. Right. So, it's staying on the ecosystem for a minute, um, you know, big space security, crowded space. You were just at RSA, it was just like crazy. Crazy, tons of startups. And I, when, I, I, when I talk to startups, in fact, I was talking to one the other day, it's a, it's a fishing startup, guys out of the NSA doing some really interesting stuff. They got to place bets, small companies. And I'm like, have you seen what ServiceNow is doing? I mean, it's kind of an interesting play. You, you might be able to participate in that ecosystem some way, somehow. Is it reasonable to think that startups actually can participate? How can they participate? Can they bring their innovation to you? Or are you really looking for established players with an install base that, that you can draft off of? Sure, we actually, we're actually doing both right now. So you can think about it, you know, being a new player in the security community, credibility is something we're always seeking to grow and, and develop over time. So while we really like to integrate with the large established security vendors that our customers expect us to integrate with, we also love talking to the innovative startups and integrating with them as well. So we have a whole technology partner program that allows people to tie into the ecosystem. We have a whole business development team in my organization where we work actively with these companies to help them take best advantage of, of what integrating with ServiceNow can do. I mean, I think it's key because I if you think about the innovation sandwich we often talk about, for years this industry has marched to the cadence of Moore's Law. It was doubling you know, microprocessor speeds every two years that drove innovation. That was nice, that got us a long way, but it seems like innovation today is a combination of data, applying machine intelligence, and, and cloud, cloud economics. And part of cloud economics, you get you know, scale economies, zero marginal cost at volume, but it's also the ability to attract startups. And, and, and we see that as critical for innovation, do you agree? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the innovation we're seeing in the security uh, world overall, I think, is going to continue to grow. As you saw at RSA, you know, there's always another several hundred vendors, it seems like, that, that, that are out right. there. And I think we have, as an industry, toyed with the idea of a suite or a consolidation, and it's always been next year is going to be this massive consolidation, and it's never seemed to really happen. And what I'm, what I'm thinking is, this notion of something like what security operations can do from ServiceNow, where you're not, you're sort of making a suite by building an abstraction layer that integrates all the technology, so you get the, the benefits of a suite while still being able to go best of breed with the individual technologies right. that you want. Yeah, it's consolidation of technologies and becoming safer every year. Those are two things that haven't happened. Hopefully, Sean, ServiceNow can help us with that problem. Uh, put a bow on, uh, on Knowledge18. What's the takeaway? From your the standpoint. takeaway for us is that uh, security automation and security orchestration is now here, right? Two years ago, the conversation was, what, what is ServiceNow doing in security? Now my conversations with customers are, I understand, I'm looking at this market overall, I see the value that it can provide to me. We've got customers on stage, we've got customers leading sessions that are talking about their own transformational experience. So I think the, the, the technology is here, Gartner has labeled this category, security orchestration, automation, and response, which is big for the, for the industry overall. Right. So I think, um, I think it's here now, and I think we've got a, we've got a great capability tying into a common platform, and of course tightly tying to IT, where many of our 4,000 customers already are using ServiceNow. Who's your favorite superhero? Uh, Wolverine, <laughs> no doubt. Right. You know why I'm asking. <laughs> I, I don't know why you're oh, asking. Oh, come on, you're the one who told me that when you're all security guys when they're little kid, the oh, kids, yeah, they, yeah. they dreamed about saving the world, so you got to have yeah. a favorite superhero. Well, Wolverine's a pretty dark guy, so I don't know that that, that works very well with that analogy. Uh, it sells more movies. Yeah. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Modern era. Sean, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Hey, thanks so much. You. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from ServiceNow Knowledge 18.